Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, part four of our uh, Tech Talk series. Uh, my name is Larry Vavro, and uh, I'm a senior precious engineer here at Ignite. And today I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, failover and zero downtime and how Scalar can help you achieving uh, this kind of zero downtime in a database environment. So uh, for today's agenda, I'm going to start a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, a high level, uh, high level details about what is zero downtime. How do we want, like, especially in particularly in the database environment, uh, what are the ultimate goals and uh, how should we achieve the zero downtime and how can Scala help you? Then I'm going to move over to a short demo. Uh, in which I'm going to perform a failover of uh, uh, my always-on uh, availability group uh, SQL Server uh, failover. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of notions of of details of uh, of the failover itself, and then I'm going to move over to uh, MySQL, which is slightly different, a similar concept of failover, slightly different uh, uh, process. And uh, at the end of the session, I'm just going to go through uh, a, perhaps the most interesting part, uh, uh, the customization of the failover. Uh, a lot of you, I know, uh, uses uh, very uh, custom uh, methods, custom uh, replication, uh, have particular needs. Uh, this is where I'm going to talk about how to implement those uh, within Scalarc. And also, uh, I'm going to go over uh, some settings and fine tuning for the failover. And at the end, uh, of course, I will be uh, happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. So first of all, why do we even need a zero downtime? Uh, it's perhaps it's, a, it's, a, it's not that difficult uh, question to answer. Of course, we want to be competitive. We want to provide an uninterrupted services. Uh, especially the risk of a downtime, the downtime itself, it costs money. Uh, and uh, of course, from the business perspective, we want to always be available for our users, for our, our customers, uh, for the from the database perspective, of course, for the for the application itself. And those are all very important aspects, uh, perhaps most commonly brought into uh, the picture when talking about zero downtime. But there are also a few other uh, aspects that perhaps are a little bit underappreciated, but uh, but they're also uh, quite important. In particular, uh, the application development. Um, imagine uh, if you uh, can rely on the database uh, being always available, being there for you. And uh, basically, from the application developer's, perspe developer's perspective, this is an ideal world. Uh, uh, you do not have to employ as many defensive programming skills. You do not need to uh, do all of the kind of topology, hard coding, all of those details that perhaps uh, are, are prolonging your uh, time to market with the applications. Perhaps they're uh, polluting your actual business logics. And this, so this is all important. Now, one last thing, and I think it's, it's, it's always, uh, 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 it's my personal favorite in the, in the kind of zero downtime environment is that the limited logistics that you need to conduct in order to, uh, to implement any change to perform a topology change or to uh, uh, do patching or uh, perform a release. All of those, all of those changes can now be uh, done with, with virtually zero downtime. And, this, and this, is, this is very, very important because it saves you a lot of time. It, it allow you to focus what, what's important and allow you to move quicker through all of those uh, details. Now, um, and like in order to do get to this zero downtime, I guess I've I've distilled few points. Now there's of course there's uh, there's plenty more, and we can come up with uh, with loads aspects that uh, perhaps are not on the slide. But in this context, I've distilled those few points. Uh, what do we need to achieve this kind of zero downtime uh, database environment? And first of all, we need to eliminate. Uh, any single point of failure. Uh, and of course, by creating cluster databases, by adding additional uh, hosts, 
uh, we are mitigating this. But also the database, the, from the data perspective and from this, uh, from consistency, that's also uh, can be considered single point of failure. Therefore, we need some sort of a mid layer that will be able to administrate that, to be able to shield that, and detect any failure quickly to be able to fix it or perhaps uh, move the traffic to a different server. So detection of the failure is also very, very critical. Um, of course, in order to have zero downtime, we need to be able to perform maintenance, uh, to perform changes on our infrastructure. Uh, now, all of this is very critical, but if we have to do it manually, uh, this is we're becoming this uh, this this person, the single point of error, you might say. So, uh, the, enabling the automation of all these tasks is also very very critical. So, having uh, API endpoints, having uh, uh, perhaps a possibility of scripting everything, uh, this is this is critical. And of course, on the end of the day, uh, the nature of the data, the integrity of the data, and 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 the database itself uh, will inevitably uh, lead us to some downtime on the database side. And we need to be able to handle that, uh, to shield that from the application. So the application doesn't uh, doesn't know uh, that there is there has been, perhaps it was a five second downtime for, uh, downtime for, a, for a resynchronization of the nodes when we were adding or removing a node or perhaps changing the roles. Those are inevitable changes of, of the database nature. And, and we need to be able to deal with that. So how does how can we achieve that with Scalarc? Well, of course, Scalarc uh, mitigate the risk of single point of error being database uh, by ad adding uh, the additional layer and, and protecting it. Uh, now, we don't want Scalarc uh, to become the single point of failure now. So uh, Scalarc actually works in the uh, either active-passive uh, uh, deployment whereby the passive uh, server observes their active and it takes up its role whenever the active becomes faulty or we take it down for maintenance uh, or for some other reason. Uh, in order to even improve this redundancy, we can deploy Scalarc in active-active uh, uh, setup whereby they work, uh, both Scalarcs works, uh, work in conjunction and uh, they can uh, they can they can meet that you can basically move traffic from one to the other at your will and and, and there will be uh, there will be basically this will be invisible uh, uh, from the uh, from the application perspective you can load balance through them uh, Scalarc does monitor all the aspects of the database such as uh, the health of it the response times the uh, uh, the amount of connections, the the uh, the replication lag, all of those aspects are being monitored within Scalarc, and uh, and Scalarc is able to make smart decisions about it, which is which is exactly how we can mitigate this risk if some uh, database is misbehaving. Scalarc is able to react quickly to that, and uh, I've mentioned briefly that Scalarc protects the database. Uh, and yes, it does that to use uh, using the search queue. And I'm sure all of you heard this. Basically, Scalarc is capable of buffering traffic uh, incoming uh, from the application, and holding the traffic. It actually accepts the connections, even if the database is down, and then basically unload the queries, uh, runs the queries, and return the results whenever the database is ready again to serve, to uh, uh, to handle those requests. And of course. The failover automation. Uh, this is critical. We don't want to. Uh, uh, we don't want just to get Nemo saying that our database is down. We want. Uh, we want our application to be able to react to it, and fix the issue uh, whenever it's possible. Uh, and Scalar can do that. So, given this short, brief kind of uh, background on 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 the Scalar. Uh, with no further ado, uh, let's jump into uh, a short demonstration of uh, how does uh, how does it actually work within Scalarc. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over. I'm gonna start with SQL Server. I'm gonna introduce you to the bleed of time paradigm, and 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 then we're gonna move to uh, uh, I'm gonna, which which is gonna enable you to basically perform zero downtime maintenance, and then I'm gonna move over to my SQL, which is very similar, but there is a slight differences. Uh, to how the failover happens. 
So um, in this cluster, uh, that I hope you can see on your screen, uh, we have we have uh, if uh, in this catalog we have few clusters defined. Uh, I have my Aurora cluster. I have my always on uh, SQL Server cluster, which I'm going to use for demo today. And I also have um, another cluster uh, which is custom that I'm going to come back to at a later slide uh, when I'm going to be talking about a little bit about automation of uh, of uh, of failover of customization and the customization of failover. So right now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to trigger a failover between the master to the slave one. In order, in order to do that, I'm going to connect to my uh, NS SQL slave one server. Uh, let me just type in my password. I have a, a command prompt there, and now uh, there is a there is a command uh, that will trigger the failover. Now, of course, we can do it uh, through uh, through SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, we can do it through some other means, uh, but I'm just going to do it here because what I can do here, I can just make this window smaller and we can watch what's going to happen here as soon as I uh, trigger this uh, failover. So let me just hit go on this statement. And, uh, and there you go. So right now, uh, this query is running. We can see that immediately the master server went red. Uh, which means it stopped accepting traffic. Uh, we have some events, of course, going on, see, uh, alerting us, uh, Scalarc alerting us that the slave uh, down or replications broken, so the servers are being down. And right now you can see that this one gets promoted, but we still have two servers down. So let's see what actually is happening. So it's going to take a few seconds for this to come back. And in the meantime, I'm going to go into our cluster stats here. Oh, there you go. Slave 2 is back and just master server is back online. And I'm going to go to my cluster stats to see what has happened in behind the scenes. And we can see some traffic coming in and then the traffic depleted. Our total queue, our queue kind of populated when we could, we weren't able to handle traffic because the servers were down and then it started again. And we can see a little bit of a bump here. So essentially this errors, we can see that actually there were eight errors during this procedure. And the reason for that is because those eight transactions, those eight queries were actually running when I hit go on this failover logics. So of course, this is unwanted. And this is, this is where we introduce, when we can introduce the notion of bleed of time. So in order to show you how to do that, let me just go back to our cluster screen and do and fail over back to our master server, but this time I'm going to be using bleed of time. So uh, first of all, let me just uh, trigger my connection to our master server. Okay, I'm going to run the very same query here, but before I hit go, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to actually make this server, mark this server as offline. What that's going to allow us to do is uh, specify the amount of time where all connections are going to be basically terminated. So I'm going to I'm going to say five seconds. Um, now, of course, you need to tailor this down down to uh, to whatever your the, the the length of the queries are, uh, the usual length of the connections. I think five seconds should be sufficient to bleed off all the all the connections to this uh, right master node uh, that I have. I'm just going to hit confirm on that update server and right now we can see that this one is uh, crossed out uh, which means it, it's no longer accepting new connections for five seconds after it's being marked off it's still accepted connections I'm gonna do I'm gonna go and trigger failover here back to our master node and two things I'm gonna achieve here usually and my clusters are usually in a relatively good health because they're all in the in the, in the AWS uh, environment with a relatively low latency, but depending on your setup, you might see that sometimes it might take a longer time to perform a failover because the cluster will take a longer time to uh, uh, to resynchronize during the failover. And uh, this bleeding off, the fact that there is no writes happening uh, at the time of the failover, has actually uh, a can be your cluster can benefit from that, and your failovers might be a little bit quicker. Now I'm going to go back to our cluster stats before it disappears. And two things you can see in here. First of all, we, have, we no longer can see any errors, which is great. 
And also one other thing is you can see that this queue started growing before all the connections been closed. And this is basically the bleed of time that happened here. So, uh, and this way we actually mitigated the risk of in-flight transactions. Of course, if our transaction, if our query running uh, for a longer time than our bleed of time, then uh, it could have been still affected. Uh, so we need to make sure that the, to kind of, uh, to, to, to set our bleed of time correctly, appropriately uh, in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, to mitigate this risk, so let me um, let me uh, let me uh, now go into MySQL and perform a, perhaps a little bit similar uh, thing with MySQL, uh, but also a, a little bit different, because uh, in case of MySQL, in case of SQL Server, uh, Microsoft Technology Always on Availability Group. Uh, does look after all the failovers, everything that is happening within this replication. Now, MySQL uh, gives a little bit more control over uh, this logic, uh, a little bit less tooling, perhaps. Uh, so, um, you need to, uh, Scanrock has built uh, within itself a functionality to perform those failovers, to automate this failing over within Scanrock cluster, uh, within MySQL clusters, uh, just from the UI. So one thing you might notice, this is my MySQL cluster. It's actually a MariaDB in behind the scenes, uh, fully compatible with MySQL. Uh, so uh, you can notice here that uh, we have an auto failover button here. And if I want to perform a failover, and the other thing uh, uh, you might notice here that actually those servers are marked as standby. In SQL Server, let me just jump there back for a second, where read because uh, essentially, we don't have an opportunity to mark server as standby. It's AAG, the always on availability group that defines that. Now, with MySQL, we can mark them as a standby plus read or a standby and no read, which means that it's offline. And those are the two main differences. Now, if we want to perform a failover on this cluster, uh, if we jump over to this uh, screen of auto failover, I'm going to skip, I'm going to go through those options a little bit later. Uh, but uh, initially, I'm just going to uh, uh, want to drag your attention to this uh, button for switch over. If I hit that button, it's going to pick another, the next available standby server and fail over to the server. So let's see what's going to happen. I'm going to uh, introduce, again, five seconds of bleed of time. Uh, this is actually, the pro it simplifies the process a little bit as well, because we can do it with one button there. And I'm going to go back to clusters. And we can see, first of all, um, in a few seconds, it's going to start uh, triggering this failover. Okay, so this event has been scheduled correctly. We can see that it went to standby mode now. Uh, so right now, the cluster has this opportunity to resynchronize. And in a few seconds, this one is going to is going to be marked as read write. There you go. And server is back online. Now, if we go over to our cluster stats again. Uh, on this graph, we can see at the short bleed of time of five seconds, no errors whatsoever. And then after uh, this very, very short period, how many seconds was that? Uh, probably approximately, I don't know, uh, five, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, somewhere in this region of 10 seconds, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the traffic again started flowing. So uh, with no errors, no disruption to the application, we, will, we were able to perform this failover. Let me jump over here uh, just to do a short recap. Uh, we did a planned failover in uh, SQL Server. We introduced bleed of time. Uh, we, uh, as, a, as an outcome of that, we had a server that has been marked offline because remember then we were, when, we were, uh, uh, when we were performing this bleed of time, we marked the server as offline. So this is, this is, this is important to remember. And then, uh, and then basically we, we were able to, uh, uh, to, to have the server uh, ready for maintenance. And then we uh, did a planned failover within MySQL. Now, the next thing I wanted to show you is, uh, is the script-based failover, this kind of custom failover uh, that, uh, that is, that is uh, sometimes uh, very useful to, uh, to know, uh, to perform, uh, purely because sometimes uh, and we've seen this with a lot of our customers that uh, sometimes our customers are actually using external replication tools. 
and this is um, and, and and this is uh, this is quite useful. Uh, this script-based failover in these circumstances, because essentially what you can do is um, is perform a custom steps. So let's say if you have a, uh, if you have a a custom API that you need to call, or if you want to swap, if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, run some resynchronization process. If let's say your 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 replication between two boxes is asynchronous, and for some reason uh, you might want to um, you might want to basically uh, resynchronize manually or do some uh, a custom algorithms. This is this is how you would do it. And and a few few situations where we actually use that script and we have a pre-prepared script is a P2P replication in SQL Server, as well as a, a, a transactional replication. So those are some some scenarios. But also you can implement your own scenarios. And I'm going to show the other options as well. So let me jump back into this class, uh, this uh, my uh, SQL Server cluster. And let me start this. Uh, uh, it's being it's stopped now. Let me start this custom uh, cluster here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to first of all go into this auto failover uh, option here. I have this option because basically I have not configured this cluster as an always on. It's just basically I've added all the servers separately and told Skerak to uh, that this is a cluster. So Skerak does not understand fully replication. I would have to configure it further to understand the replication. And also, I need to configure this, uh, the failover type. And of course, in case of mirroring, we can select mirroring. What I want to show is the external API option here. And when the failover occurs with this external API options, we can select a script that's going to be triggered. I have prepared a wrapper or script, which I'm, which I'm going to show you in a few seconds. Uh, now, uh, what I'm gonna want to pay attention, uh, what I'm gonna drag, want to drag, uh, what I want to drag your attention here to is the fact that we have this auto failover for, for P2P and transactional replication template. So if you want to use this uh, for your uh, auto failover, if you use this uh, technology, this is the script that you would want to use. Uh, once you uh, decide, uh, select it, you might want to download it, and then and then basically. Uh, once it's downloaded, you would edit it, change all the options within this script, and then uh, you can start using it uh, for uh, the failover. I have pre-prepared a much simplified, because P2P transactional replication uh, failover is actually quite complex. So I have prepared a very, very simple uh, swap role script. And let me uh, bring it here onto the screen. And this is... Uh, this is a very simple script that I've prepared uh, for the purpose of this demo. All it does, it collects some options uh, from the uh, command line parameter that are being passed into the script. But the most critical uh, statements are this and this. What I'm essentially doing here, I'm calling a, a Scalarc API uh, endpoint that is responsible for assigning roles. So essentially, we have a swap a server role API to which we can perform a put method in order to assign a server role. And what I'm doing here is basically taking the first server and assigning it uh, the role from the second server and taking a, uh, uh, the second server and assigning the role from the first one. So this is very simple. Of course, we might want to add uh, perhaps uh, use some uh, PyODBC connection here to connect to some database to perform some checks and balances to make sure that we can do that. Uh, this is just very, very simple script that would fit on one screen for the uh, purpose of the demonstration. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to just hit switch over. I'm going to, uh, of course, introduce uh, some uh, bleed of time, although, uh, although uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very simple uh, uh, operation. And right now, what I'm going to see, I'm actually, uh, my master was read write, and my slave was standby read, and they have swapped basically. So this is this is a, a, a simple way how you can uh, achieve this kind of change of roles, and perhaps uh, you might want to some external script that is uh, triggering failover to call this 
uh, to tr call to trigger failover within Scalar can change those roles. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you want uh, Scalar to be to be this kind of um, director of any failovers and then connect to all the external uh, external systems to perform those failovers. So so it depends on what your use case is. This is how you would approach that. And um, going further here, let me uh, jump over uh, to uh, some other customization options. Um, as you might have noticed before, of course, I've, I, I've skipped over those options here at the top of the screen. First option is auto failover. Um, and depending on the database technology, uh, depending on the, of the, of the setup that you're using, you might want auto failover to be on or you might want the auto failover to be off. So uh, if you switch it on, then Scalac will start monitoring your servers. And what is going to happen then is basically Scalark will um, will come in, uh, will uh, will go in and um, and monitor this box. And if any failure occurs, if there is any uh, any bit, any uh, outage slowdown, it will then uh, use this setting here for the to decide whether this uh, this node is actually down or whether it's actually uh, uh, or whether it is uh, it is working, uh, and it will wait for it. So if the server comes back online with this this period period, Scalark will not trigger failover. But if it exceeds this period, uh, default is two seconds. Then of course it's going to decide. Okay, this node is now down, and I'm going to perform a failover. Now the second option here is also a very important to remember. Uh, it's a flip flop time, and this is something that perhaps it's uh, sometimes might be a. Uh, uh, a little bit counterintuitive if you if you have a cascading failure. So sometimes in some situations you might have this uh, experience whereby one node fails after the other. And in this uh, situations uh, there is a there is a possibility of introducing a lot of downtime uh, by switching roles constantly by switching these roles and if you have if you're experiencing this there is this kind of security measure that uh, you can put here in place to avoid too frequent failovers uh, so if you have one type uh, one failure after another failure scalar will actually wait for this period of time before performing a subsequent failover so in this circumstances this situation uh, I uh, just kind of want to emphasize that there is this setting here. So if Scarec is not hovering the auto failover, perhaps you might want to adjust it to uh, meet your expectations and your setup. Um, okay, so we went through this. Uh, we went through uh, uh, went through custom failover setup and fine tuning uh, and fine tuning. So those kind of options of custom failover. I know this uh, this uh, script, of course. Uh, I there's a there's a lot of aspects of this script there's uh there are parameters that are being passed in there's a lot of details that I just don't have a chance to go to uh in uh, in this uh a scheduled session but if you're interested in implementing this custom fail uh, failover script just yet do not hesitate and contact us we we will help you uh do that uh if if you have such a use case um of course uh, Another, uh, another. Uh, uh, we went through, we went through other kind of uh, also uh, settings for. The, we went to other uh, settings for automatic failover and the flip flop timeout. Uh, and right now, I think uh, it's time for a Q and A. Uh, Suzanne, do we have any questions on the on the material that we had today? I'm pretty sure uh, there is. There was a lot to digest. Uh, and maybe questions will come back uh, later. So if there are any questions, do not hesitate to send us an email and ask them. Uh, now, uh, right now, are, are there any questions in the chat box that we can that we can um, address? Yes. The first question we got in was, can the custom failover script connect to external databases? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it can yes yeah. so so the script that you're uh, defining there it can either be uh, internally hosted on within uh, Scalarc and that's absolutely fine to use uh, it can also be uh, hosted 
uh, outside of Scalar. So um, uh, in this case, you can you can perhaps call external API. Now, uh, if you host it within Scalarc, you can still leverage uh, the kind of PyODBC and those kind of libraries uh, to connect uh, to and 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 basically perform this uh, this this maintenance. Are there any other questions? That is all the questions we have today. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please join us for the final episode of this series where we'll talk about seamlessly migrating to the cloud without incurring any application downtime. On behalf of Ignite Technologies, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of the day.